and I'll now call upon the first affirmative speaker. Okay, sorry about that. Let me just grab my phone. Okay, I'm going to start in three, two, one. Pacific Island nations produce some of the most talented rugby players in the world. And it often hurts the ordinary pe people in those countries to see their young men and women playing rugby for other countries, for countries where those people move to in order to be able to play rugby, in order to be successful. And it doesn't hurt for the reason that you might think. It hurts because it's a reminder that they themselves do not have the money, they do not have the support, and they do not benefit from the colonialism that enables them to run those programs and make them successful and have a team that is full of people who were born in that particular place and who speak and represent for that particular community. It is obviously incredibly important to ensure that in a context where colonialism has been the predominant transmission mechanism for sport, that that, uh, that the countries that produce talent, which is so often the colonized countries, are able to pay compensation to the colonizers, uh, to receive compensation from the colonizers. The first thing I'll do in this speech is do a setup on the model and what we think this looks like, noting this is a should debate and we have a reasonable degree of fiat in order to make, in order to set that model up. I'll then explain the important principle of entitlement and why people these countries deserve a right to compensation. And then finally, I'll explain how this affects national teams, how it affects the development programs within these countries and how it affects the sport as a whole. The first thing then, onto the setup and model, we would note, obviously, the normal eligibility rules that currently exist to apply. And that also means that, for example, countries are still very likely to want to have talented players play for the national teams and are likely to try and you know, convince players to talk, to play for their various teams, just as it occurs in the status quo. The second observation we'd make as the current is the country is, is is obviously under when a player from a particular place then goes and plays for a well you know play the player go from one one particular country goes and plays for another country's national team, as often occurs, the country of origin is compensated by the country of destination. The size of that compensation is determined by one, the kind of cost of the development, that any, any development cost that country bore, but also to a fraction of the expected value that player is worth. We can use previous like transactions in terms of how much a player was transferred for. There are obviously a marketplace for players currently that can value how much a player might be valued worth, but also it would be weighted by ability to pay. So don't believe any arguments from the negative team about how very poor countries Countries might, for some, you know, in some unique circumstances, be expected to fork out millions of dollars, uh, you know, for, you know, millions of dollars, even though we think that's quite unlikely in the first place, because often wealthier countries are the recipients of the talent. So the first thing I'll do is explain why, why there is a principle of compensation that ought to apply here. And importantly, I want to establish a set of a, a set of kind of contextual facts, which, while unnecessary for the argument, amplify its power tremendously. And that is to know that many of the destination countries, i.e., the countries that are able to have a player who's particularly talented to play for the national team uh, primarily occur in the West. And there are kind of three very structural reasons for this. The first is that fans in the West, because they are Western countries and because they tend to have larger economies, have more money, which is why the largest sports markets are there. That's why the largest teams are there. Two, they often have extremely prestigious domestic leagues with a great and strong history. Players grow up dreaming of playing Real Madrid or Liverpool. 
The third is we point to players often want to go to high prestige countries in order to be able to play for the highest prestige national team because that is how their star can move forward. That, that notes, and, and crucially, right, that explains why it is often Western countries who are the beneficiaries of talents which has moved across and it is why they are likely to be the ones who are paying out just purely because of the way like the economic geography here works. But we would note a couple of things that mean that the benefit that flows to the Western team is some, to these Western, or well, predominantly Western teams, is a benefit that that is actually contributed to and created, the value is created by uh, by by these poorer nations, by the uh, nations of origin. There are a couple of reasons for this. One, obviously, these poorer nations are often crucial in developing a player during their early years or during you know the entirety of their development and building and building their love of the sport, connecting to the sport. Two, obviously, it is the process of colonialism and the resource extraction and continuing resource extraction that occurs that has made these Western countries very, very rich and able to pay the high salaries that motivates people to move across and wanting to play sport there, which is obviously an explicit way in which West can continue to benefit. Three, the, set, the third thing we note is obviously this, this once, a, once the West becomes, say, has an income gap, is able to exploit that income gap, become wealthier over time. And fourthly, it's obviously... It's obviously morally correct to undo these wrongs as much as possible, which is why I'll get to this material and compensation. I want to point out here, though, an important piece of framing, which is that during in, in sporting contests, you know, it is often the place where colonized nations are able to, you know, win victories over the colonizers, often very important symbolic victories. We point to the West Indian cricket team and their victories against the, Australia, the, the British cricket team during the 1980s. It's crucially important that nation's sense of self that nations and the nation's national pride. Obviously, when players from these countries play for a colonizing team, that national pride becomes far more complicated, one, but two, the glory and the ability to be part of that team and be part of such an excellent sporting team is one that accrues primarily to the Western team. It's seen as an instance of Western success, not of colonized success. We would note then, accordingly, given that the country of origin has contributed the talent and they suffer a loss, right, a genuine loss, each time a player who could play for them chooses to play for a more prominent or for a better, better paying Western team, they do not, they do not get access, they, they lose out or if they lose out and the Western team benefits, there is clear harm there, that, that, which means they're entitled to some kind of compensation. This principle is incredibly important because these wins and sport itself is important. It's important to these people's self-conception. And it's generally important to compensate people when you benefit from when you benefit uh when you benefit from their subjugation from their lack of money from their own from the development and the work they've done to put players together so how does this ha that's the kind of principle done the second question is how does this affect the composition of national teams the important context here is that there is often an oversupply of talent player players from often poorer and smaller nations move to larger and richer nations and then try and compete to become part of that national team many of them however don't make the cut what this does is is this increases on the margin it makes it more expensive for national teams teams to uh to play to hire those players and to 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 put them in the national team which obviously means they have to spend either one spend more and give it to the give it to the recipient country we'll explain why they use that money well in a second or as we think is often the case they will encourage those players to play for their country of origin and we think importantly individual players will be able to see a price tag for how much they're actually potentially costing their own national country and they get to make the choice for themselves which is why any material they might make about players is significantly less less impactful because uh, under our Side, players have significantly more information, therefore significantly more autonomy when they make choices. We would point to the fact that in, in you know in, in these situations, these players can decide for themselves. And we expect two things to occur. We expect some money to flow back as particularly talented players play for you know Western or you know country destination country teams, but also players to play for their teams in the country of origin. And therefore, instead of having like a whole bunch of really amazing sports players in one sport league competing for a limited number of national team spots, you see an overall spread of net talent as people go and play for their country of origin they move to those teams is far better for the or country of origin teams this has a set of implications the first is those teams are far more able to be competitive in global competitions which is incredibly important for them and for the people who live there the second thing is it's obviously also quite good for the sport which is an incredibly important benefit when you consider the total time utility that audiences experience when they watch sport when they experience and they watch a good sport but finally these countries can take this money and because fans are likely to hold them to account they're incredibly likely to put this money into building proper programs and that means 
right, that Tonga now has a significant inflow of capital with which they can use to build a proper rugby team to fund their own development and prevent players from going over to the West. And it gives them incentive to develop players because they know every player they develop who goes to play for in Australia or in New Zealand is a player, is, 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 a, is a cash cow, which means they're likely, highly likely, to be able to and have every incentive to build and make more of those players, to build and make build better development programs, and in the long run, eventually be able to contest with the bigger teams. Incredibly proud. Thank the first affirmative speaker for that speech and welcome the first negative speaker. Hello, I assume you can hear me. Okay, sweet. This affirmative team wants to have this debate only in the very specific and very small set of circumstances that is the most favourable to them. That is to say, yes, it is true that sometimes players from the Pacific Islands go to play like go to play for big countries like Australia or England, but overwhelmingly that is not the direction of the flow of these players. Overwhelmingly, this debate is about players who are raised in big wealthy countries and they want to go and play for, play for the smaller countries uh, that they that they the smaller countries of their heritage. That's things like uh People and players raised in, raised or born in France who want to go back to, to play for countries like Algeria or the DRC uh, or Burundi, this team also imposes a tax on all of them. We will explain why that is the far more likely characterization uh, in this debate and we'll make a series of arguments on the back of that. First of all, though, I just want to clarify why overwhelmingly this characterization of the debate is like it is more likely. First of all, it's just for the reason that, and I think this is an analysis that Brendan literally gives in his speech, which is to say that often it is very hard to make national teams in big countries uh, and so that means that there is a push for people who live and have been born and have been raised in those countries to go back to other countries uh, but the second thing to say uh, is that there are just many more smaller nations right which suggests that, like that there are a few big countries that have a lot of money there are a lot of small nations which suggests that on net the flow is likely to be from large countries to small countries but thirdly also it is just unclear why players would want to play for countries that they are not from they have literally no connection to overwhelmingly it is likely that people that, that individual players have incentives to go back and play for the country uh, of their ethnicity of their eth ethnicity uh, and their heritage, maybe the country that their mother was from or the country that their family was from before they immigrated. That is a huge portion of this debate that this affirmative team have to account for. Three arguments then in this speech. Firstly, a principle. Secondly, explaining why national teams now just will not pick players from other countries. And thirdly, explaining whether where the money transfer does happen, it is likely to be bad. First of all, on the principle, we'll explain why it is morally illegitimate to require this. Uh, and this is quite this argument quite quickly wins the debate. The upshot of this argument is just that this requires uh, teams to pay for something. It is only legitimate at the point at which the affirmative team proves that proves that that is always necessary. And, you know, Brendan does analysis to, to suggest that in a small set of instances, it is maybe warranted, uh, but they, the burden on the affirmative team is to prove that it is necessarily owed in every circumstance. Uh, and if we can prove that there are circumstances where it is not owed, that suggests, uh, that literally nukes the affirmative team's case because then it is illegitimate, it is an illegitimate requirement. So why is this not something that is owed all the time? Firstly, I just want to contribute a response to what, uh, like, to the big mechanism that Brendan gives in that speech, which is just to say that, ah, colonialism is bad and these countries owe reparations for colonialism. Ah, uh, that is non sequitur in this motion, right? There is no specific analysis to suggest why these individual players are, are like ought to be the pawns of colonialism, why this kind of reparations is specifically owed here. None of that analysis is, is fully fleshed out. But three additional reasons why in every situation is not it is not true uh, that this is owed. First of all, ah, uh, Countries have a right to pick someone not born in their country if they live there. That is to say, even if you are not born in a particular country, the fact that you live there, the fact that you've been raised there, which we would suggest is, is a large portion of these people, of these players who are being swapped between countries, you are a legitimate member of that nation. It is extraordinarily unclear why it is why it is not legitimate for those kind of for you to be picked for that country's national team. But second of all, uh, often if you have been born in another country and moved when you were young, which we would suggest is a lot, is a lot of these people, uh, often these countries have raised those players. They have contributed to their development. And this obviously is the opposite of the analysis that Brennan gives. Both of these situations obviously exist, but this analysis just shows that even it's true that both of these situations exist, it is principally illegitimate to require those kinds of repayments on all of them. Uh, the third thing to say though, is that uh, if you, if it is the, sorry, if the situation is that you go to play for the country of your heritage, it is 
it's also unclear why you're not a legitimate, uh, why it is not legitimate for that country to pick you. You have, like, you have the heritage and the ethnicity of the people in that country. You feel aligned with it enough to go and play for that country. Super unclear why it would, why uh, that country ought to be required to pay for you to do that. Uh, so maybe it is true that there are some players who are, uh, there are some players who fit the characterization that this affirmative team wants to push. But uh, I would, the important thing to note here is that this requirement extends to everyone. The burden is far, far higher on them than they think it is. They have to explain why this requirement is necessary all the time we can win the debate here alone this is uh, alone this is principally illegitimate and uh, i would note that this can be debate winning for the negative team we can prove that this is Ill uh, that this is illegitimate they can only prove that it is legitimate this principle is permissive for them it is debate winning for us second argument then uh, national teams now just will not pick players from other countries and that is an enormous harm. Why is that true? Three things to say. First of all, uh, the cost of this is a huge disincentive uh, and for their benefits to accrue, uh, I think you sort of like for a lot of their benefits to accrue, they said they will do this on a sliding scale, but obviously even if it is measured on capacity to pay, the cost is still a disincentive, right? Like maybe you have the capacity to pay, but you are still still likely to be like, you probably still don't want to fork out a huge amount of money to pay for these players. Uh, but also just for their benefits to apply, you would need to, be, like all of their benefits of like having money for development, you would need to believe that these players are priced quite high. Uh, and so that should suggest to you that for these countries, there is an opportunity cost of doing things like training and doing things like development to selecting these players. And given that national uh, confederations often are quite poor, the, the massive cost of, of taking these players Players is a disincentive. Second of all, there are often political reasons why countries would not want to pay for for, uh, for particular players. Uh, and I think this is sort of the most applicable in the characterization that I established earlier in this speech, which is that often these are the countries who have been victims of colonialism. Of course, Algeria does not want to pay reparations to France for the fact that they've taken one of their players who, who is ethnically Algerian. That is absurd. Those countries will not want to take those players. They will miss out on a huge amount of talent because they just won't, uh, because they just won't select them. But thirdly, uh, the oh, what? Uh, anyway, at the end of that, uh, the upshot of that is that often these players literally just will not be picked. Uh, a few reasons why, uh, and I guess I'll give here a few reasons why uh, the other incentives for the reasons that you would want these players are unlikely to be overcome. The first thing to say is that the benefit of taking any specific player often is speculative. That is, the cost of paying for them is certain, but you do not know how well they will mesh with your team. You do not know how, how well they will play in any given season. So the benefit of taking them is speculative, but you know you have to fork over a huge amount of cash. That means you are unlikely to want to take them in the first place. Second of all, those players are likely to be under an enormous amount of pressure at the, at the point at which they have literally been paid for. The the entire like the entire fan base the entire government knows they've been paid for it's likely to be under a huge amount of pressure which means once this start once this policy is implemented they're likely to start playing worse that will poison the well uh, for for these countries for these national teams selecting those people in the first place but thirdly they want to often there's an incentive to bring players into the national system young which is and, and at that point it's quite hard to know how good those players will be this means you just will not select them because uh, you will not select them because it's speculative the impact of that is that you do not uh, select players why is that bad first First of all, it is deeply unfair to the players themselves. First of all, they do not get to play for a country that they feel that they are aligned with, that they want to play for. Uh, it is extraordinarily unfair to literally decimate those players' careers and decimate their ability to feel that, to feel a connection via sport to, to a country that they care about. But second of all, often it makes them illegitimate, uh, sorry, ineligible for both leagues, right? So often uh, countries to play for the National League require you to be living in that country uh, and also part of, of their sort of smaller national circuits. Uh, when you cannot fulfill both of those requirements, that means you are disqualified from both. That literally decimates athletes' careers and that is terrible. The second reason why this is terrible though is that you no longer get the best set of athletes for, for any given country. Uh, and overall, that means the quality of sport diminishes and that is a harm. But thirdly, the diversity of representation in sport vanishes. And especially given the characterization that often this is migrants, play, uh, this is migrants playing for big teams, uh, this, uh, which this, uh, affirmative team wants, that is terrible. If no more Pacific Island players play in Australia anymore, that is terrible. The impact of having diversity in sport is huge. People watch those, they feel that those people are a part of their country and they feel aligned with them. Hugely important for combating racism. This team loses that, that's terrible. Thirdly, where it does happen, the transfer is likely to be bad. And I think all the analysis that I give earlier in this speech to explain why overwhelmingly this is likely to be players who are raised in big wealthy, wealthy countries and then they go back to the countries of their heritage. Uh, this uh, It is terrible to force these countries uh, to pay for these players. Uh, overwhomingly, these are small countries paying big countries. And even if it's commensurate to capacity, that is likely to be a harm. Second of all, though, now country, now national teams are less likely to develop players from other nations, and that, that is a harm. But thirdly, it will cripple, the, cripple these smaller countries if you believe their characterization. So all those reasons, proud to negate. I'd like to thank the first negative speaker for that speech and welcome the second affirmative speaker.
Uh, I know I'm audible because it echoed in our room. The world of sport is one that contains both national competitions in which we compete in international games under the idea that each nation has its team of people who live there and therefore can compete for national glory. And also there are other sporting condition, competitions that aren't based on this, like the Premier League, like other leagues that are based on, you know, being able to purchase and create whatever side that you want, right? So giving that important piece of context, let's clarify the setup for that incredibly confusing Fuse negative team. Firstly, let's point out what are the rules under which you can currently play for a national side. So you need to be able to qualify for like logistically to be a national of that country. So what are the rules that allow players to do so? Well, firstly, you can obviously be a citizen from birth, or you can be a citizen from a pretty young age, or you can be what we call the process in the in the rules is called like being naturalized, right? Which happens through a process of residency. So if you've been resident there for, for a number of years, you can be counted as being nat nat naturalized, that you kind of are naturalized into that identity. Therefore, you can kind of be counted as a part of their nation, right? And the problem with this is that that means you only ever get naturalized into another national league if that is the league, if that is the nation, sorry, where the non-national games are taking place, right? So what is the number one country that gets soccer players who gets naturalized into being technically British? It is England, right? Why? Because that is where the the Premier League takes place. So you can't really become naturalized into another nation's ethnic like nationality if you aren't ever there. And if none of the sports games happen there, it doesn't really ever work out that way. So what are the other rules under which you can be a part of a national team? Well, there are like grandparents and parents rules. So if you have grandparents from England, you can be considered eligible for the England national side. If you have grandparents from Algeria, you are technically from that country of origin and you play for their national side. So what that means is that if you actually are of that country of origin, what that team was so worried about, people who are Algerian wanting to play for Algeria, Algeria never has to pay for Algerians to play for Algeria. That was absolutely ridiculous. What was really happening to poor Algeria in this debate was that France was constantly naturalizing them into the French team and then not giving Algeria any fucking compensation for robbing them of all of the natural talent that they could have been enjoying in their national league i am so like disgusted that this team can't engage in what the debate is actually supposed to be about so what happens with these rules of nationalization some players go home to their country of origin but some people don't why is that so there are some people right now who technically could claim under naturalization rules that they can play for england but they don't so you would know that like the best you know, South Korean player in the Tottenham Hotspur team has gone back to play for Korea in this year's World Cup. But he could have tried to play for England if he had technically like arranged his residencies to try, to try and do that, right? But he's gone home. This debate is about the players who make the cut into technically counting as British or technically counting as French and they don't go home. And this debate is if they don't go home, should we be paying compensation to the country that they didn't go home to? And the answer is yes. When I say home, Home, I mean origin. I don't mean that you have to live there. I mean that your parents are from there, your grandparents are from there, that you count under the rules of that being your country of origin. So therefore, let's clarify in what circumstances do these transfers happen? What do they tell you? They tell you that what this is going to be is like people who are Algerian or people who are, you know, from the Pacific Islands being raised in a wealthy country who want to go home that are going to get taxed. That is absolutely ridiculous, right? They're not, they're, they're, first of all, if you don't actually have that as your country of origin but it's just like that like me kind of saying that I'm Irish because I have like 20% Irish heritage right that is not allowed I can't go and be a part of the Irish national team because I'm not an Irish national you international sporting games aren't race wars they are about nationality they are about where you are a citizen where you live they aren't about what your ethnic like makeup is made up from that is not how the rules work that would be deplorable and absolutely freaking disgusting and unfair
compared to the people who actually do live in Ireland and are far more Irish. I don't care if they immigrated there. That's that's the way that the national team should be decided. So with that out of the way, what happens then? We think that the obvious, like, and like you could just look at the status quo to see this, truth is that most of the people who end up changing from their country of origin to a different natural national team do it because they needed to live where the best league in the world was, because they needed to live in Spain to play soccer, they needed to live in Britain to do so, and that means that they slowly naturalise and they learn English and they never really stay home. So given that, why do I think that this is ridiculous, that it should be compensated because natural national sports are uniquely important? So importantly, every sport in the world has non-national games and often you're a part of two teams, right? If I'm Sam Kerr, I'm currently playing in the women's British like Premier League for soccer, but I also belong to the Australian national team for international games, right? So what does this mean? It means that players at this level, that they're good enough to become a national player for any country, sort of become global citizens. The justification that they have been naturalized by res residency is very unfair because it only ever occurs for countries that happen to own the best leagues. That means that they have those best leagues because they were the colonizers, because they were the ones that got to enjoy expensive universities that have access to good ovals, or they have, you know, big clubs that are run by oil magnets and have extremely large training programs and they have really big development programs and they can pay to get people over there at a young enough age that they literally move there when they're like 10 for the hopes they can become a soccer player. This is really bad because it means it's impossible to have fair country v country sports games in the international arena when some league locations get a disproportionate amount of naturalized foreign players who are incredibly genetically talented. It is very important to protect the ideology of national teams. This is because when we believe in national sports and we believe that they truly represent the country and we can rally around them and feel nationalistic. Ask yourself, panel, why do we feel so much more nationalistic about the Olympics than we do about the FIFA World Cup? The reason that we do is because we all sort of understand implicitly that the FIFA World Cup isn't really the World Cup. It's kind of like the England versus everybody else cup. It's kind of like the Spain versus everybody else cup because they happen to be able to select players from around the whole globe, whereas every other nation can only select players who actually live live in their country. And that's incredibly unfair. It means that we don't feel excited about it. It is robbing the world sporting community of being able to rally and enjoy these competitions the way that we do with the Olympic. What is the impact of that? It means that a lot of people never really learn to enjoy and participate in soccer because it is something that is unfairly dominated by a couple of countries. And it is disgusting that we allow this to go on under the guise of it being an international competition. So it is therefore principally legitimate to repay what we have, uh, what we have taken from countries who provided this genetic talent and give them a small fee. When we pay this compensation, it is beneficial in a large number of ways. Firstly, it allows the country of origin to develop its own talent development programs. But secondly, it means that if you have money and you want to consider starting a development program, regardless of if like you're getting paid fees or not, now you have an incentive as a developing nation to start developing talent because you can profit back from them when they make other, other countries' national teams and you get paid this fee. That means that there's a financial incentive for you to grow your soccer your, your soccer league or grow your football league even if you never intend on winning international games right because you can collect these fees when these players get good enough to make the English side or make another country's national side that has a massive impact on growing international sport and sending the benefits of sport to more children and discovering more talent and making it more exciting at the end of this debate where a player or originates from is the most important concept in national sport that is why the Olympics are the most exciting and not the FIFA World Cup and we were so proud to fix this problem in the international sporting arena. Thank the second affirmative speaker for that speech and welcome the second negative speaker. Starting in three, two, one. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what is the central characterization in this debate? And this is crucial because all of the affirmative team's case, their benefits about the cash flow development, their principle is hung on the premise that it is Western nations that predominantly benefit from migrant players who were born in a different country, but then become naturalized. But our claim is the teams that have the greatest composition of foreign players are in fact the countries from the global south 
athletes, like French-born players, who then decide to use their mother's Algerian passport to then represent Algeria instead. And that is why Second Affirmative's attempt to clarify this is both incredibly confused and also incredibly offensive. Because Second Affirmative concedes that one of the ways in which you can decide how to represent which country to represent is based on the mechanism of a heritage, which is exactly the example that we were talking about. But secondly, when Second Affirmative then says, oh, no, no, these players, when they decide to choose to represent Ireland, even though they were English, they're not Irish enough. Why do we should prioritize them? Diasporas are a legitimate part of nations, and it is shockingly offensive to suggest they aren't, for the very simple reason that Second Affirmative admits in her speech when she says that borders are arbitrary. Yes, that is why we should prioritize what people think and identify to be, because that is the only meaningful preference in this debate, and this affirmative team cannot gatekeep it. And to be clear, we're not saying that, um, you know, these people are now banned in, in their world. We're just saying that they are effectively banned because you've raised the cost for them to be even selected in the first place so obviously both scenarios are plausible in this debate yeah like western nations some do we and we are saying to some other countries in the global south but here are three structural reasons to believe that our characterization is more likely and therefore should be the one that is credited most in the debate firstly due to differences in developmental structure which is to say that it is countries like France and England that have the greatest money and capacity to develop a surplus of players that go to different countries, whereas often the countries in the global south, both because they are in context of financial destitution and also because they are relatively more nascent developmental structures, mean that they actually struggle to create a surplus of players that could even represent their own country, let alone the national teams of other countries. But secondly, we will point to the relative ease of migration. It is far harder for a Botswana player to decide that he would like to represent England and to get the lucky break to go to play for the English team than it is for the reverse process to happen. It's far easier for you to be English and to be from a relatively wealthier background to decide to go back to your country of your mother's or grandmother's origin. But lastly, we will just point to the differences in incentive, which is to say that it's much harder and more competitive to get into the French and English team because there are far more players, you know, who are not, who are, you know, you know, French and English competing for those spots, which means there's a greater incentive for people from migrant backgrounds in England to decide to go back to the country of their parents' origin than it is for the reverse process to happen when there's often ample spots in there because there are few players even competing for it because of the uh, paucity in development structures that are already elucidated. Those three reasons mean that, in fact, this is not a, you know, when money is transferred, it is not a reparation. It is, in fact, the extension of the colonialist practices and this perversely this affirmative team loses by their own metric. Their only preemptive response to this is, well, obviously, if you are uh, poorer country, you should have less capacity. You're not going to be being able to pay it as much. There are two reasons why this is insufficient. Firstly, it still incurs a principled harm because it is absolutely inappropriate for Algeria to have to pay for any of the French-born Algerian players to come back to them. So they still have to bite the bullet in that respect. But secondly, we would explain that often these are countries that are the most cash-strapped, who struggle to even stay afloat for their own domestic players and now have to pay the additional cost of future players so even if it's a greater marginal capacity we are pointed to the fact that they're so destitute that it is still something that is harmful so there are two scenarios here either you pay and that is reprehensible or you don't pay and therefore the player doesn't get to represent the country that they desire and that is the greatest harm in this debate i think and it's impossible for the second affirmative team to legitimize essentially gay gatekeeping in the most horrendous fashion over for them Secondly, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assume their best case scenario and say that even if it is Western nations that predominantly, you know, do this kind of thing, well, they certainly won't do so after their world for several reasons. Firstly, we would say that Western nations have no incentive now to scout players from other countries. And I'm going to be very clear here because I think the Sapona team misunderstood the argument. Western nations often do things like they decide to scout players from other countries and then get those players often when they are young to apply for citizenships with hope that, that one day they might represent France and England. Now, notably, it's not super necessary for England and France to do so. They obviously have plenty of domestic talent, but the problem is they want to be extra competitive as possible. But now 
in their world when you've made it far more expensive for England to contemplate those players to get them in and the fact that they are still not likely to succeed because they're so young you don't know where they're going to be a huge prospect now England has no incentive to do this kind of development whatsoever why is this a harm firstly we point that there are just a lot of athletes who now cannot make a li living because they were never ever selected by the English scouts in the first place and that is an enormous harm of, of these people's ability to and their and their ability to do things like social mobility but secondly we actually would say that it is bad for these countries for the very simple reason that maybe England does take a chance on a, a lot of teenagers from Botswana but those teenagers often do decide just to return back to their country that they you know after um you know a lot of thought they decide well i actually want to represent the country that i was originally born into and decide to go elsewhere so in in essence what this affirmative team is effectively doing is crippling the talent pipe that enables these countries to have youth players in the first place because it is the western nations that are doing primarily development because they have the financial capacity to do so so on the grounds of development development this negative team is absolutely out because the develop the, even if they have more money they never we would prove that the capacity for development happens actually at uh the western nations third thing to say is that uh in effect what you are doing when you are limiting the number of people that can play for these countries from migrant nations you essentially have players who are all white like the french white the french team which was largely comprised of many players from African backgrounds, that doesn't happen anymore. And there are numerous harms to this. The first is that it reinforces all the racist rhetoric that this affirmative team implicitly hides under. That, you know, race is conflated with national identity because you don't see any Black French players anymore. And that is a harm, not only to the Black people who do live in France, the Black children that watch on TV and don't have stars like Mbappe and Pogba to look up to. But secondly, it confirms all the racist stereotypes that racist French white fans say about the French national team which is that it ought to be white that it ought not include people from migrant diasporas and that is the very thing that precludes many people from ever considering a career or a desire to get into these national football teams in the first place all this fan of team is reinforce all of those harms and the thing I want to be very clear about and they never respond to are the set of reasons to explain why um why it is the case that the added cost of these nations, uh, cost of these players, means that these countries won't do it because they might say, well, they're wealthier, so they'll be able to pay more for it. We said that that's implausible for a number of reasons. The first is that uh, clearly we say that even if you're a wealthy, you know, English football association, problem is that every sports association in the world is one that is cash strapped because governments don't pay for sports. But secondly, we say that, you know, if it is the case, you have to pay exorbitant fee for development. That would suggest it is incredibly costly per player. You don't have the econ economies of scale to do so because there are few players to get even selected in the first place. For those reasons, we oppose. Thank the second negative speaker for that speech, and welcome the third affirmative speaker. Well, can I be heard? Yep. Negatives seem to rely very heavily on conflating when it is that these payments would be due. They get very confused about how rules of origin and eligibility work. So let's start by clarifying that. Players generally, the payments would only be due when a pay player plays for a country other than the country of their origin. The country of origin for a player is determined by where their heritage is from, that is the country in which they were born, or the country in which their family or their parents or grandparents had citizenship and were born. So all of those examples are not a part of the debate. What this debate is about is where a player chooses to play for a different country than their country of origin. That is to say, you can often earn eligibility to play for a country if you've lived there long enough. 
That is, maybe you are born in Tonga or your heritage is from Tonga, but you've moved to, say, Australia, and then you may gain eligibility to play for Australia. That is the instance in which there would be a payment expected because you're playing for a country other than your country of origin. So all the material they want to push down here about how this would be really terrible and that migrant dis diasporas are valid is true, but uncontentious in this debate. Just as it's a ridiculous claim that, for example, this would lead to widespread racism because the French team would no longer have black people on it, obviously. Obviously, there are many black people who are born in France and who would continue to play for the French national team. This was pretty ridiculous, guys. So the first thing I want to establish is just which way migration is likely to occur in the vast majority of cases, because they push us very heavily on this idea, and it's their main path to victory. It suggests that this would occur in unfair ways to developing countries. Why is it extraordinarily likely that the vast majority of these payments are from Western countries to developing countries? Four reasons. The first one is just to say that talent is generally randomly distributed around the world because it's often a result of the lottery of birth. Western countries don't have a monopoly on producing talented sports players. So it's very likely most of these players are randomly distributed. The West makes a very small portion of global population. The developing world is a very large portion of it. So the vast majority of these players were probably born in developing countries. Secondly, we point out the flow of migration in general is from developing countries to the West and not vice versa. So it seems that when people are playing for a country that is not their country of origin, it is overwhelmingly a Western country and not the reverse. But thirdly, we point to sports-specific reasons, right? We point out that it's Western countries that have the highest pay in their domestic leagues or for the national teams. It's those countries that have the most prestige in their domestic leagues and attract huge numbers of players. And it's those places that have the highest chance of winning and therefore attract these players, which is incredibly, which is why it is incredibly likely that it is people attempting to play for Western countries' national teams when their country of origin is in fact in a developing country. And lastly, we would just point out that first negative makes a damning concession here, which is to point out that often to be eligible to play for a particular team, you need to live in that country for a long period of time, have citizenship and play in their domestic league. It seems very frequent that, for example, a Tongan might move to Australia and want to play for the Australian team, and very unlikely that the opposite happens, that an Australian happens to have moved to Tonga, gained citizenship and plays in the domestic Tongan league, and then wants to represent that particular national country's team. So... Their claims in, re in response to this are particularly weak. They suggest, firstly, just that, well, uh, because they're more competitive team, there are more competitive teams in places in the West, that means there must be an overflow of talented players who are moving to look back. We would suggest that the vast majority of these players probably play in the domestic league. But additionally, they just say, well, France and England do all the development work. So obviously all these players must be of French or English origin. No, these are people who've moved there, but then can still, instead of playing for the French or English team, go and play for the teams in their country of origin. So there's insufficient response there to establish why the flow of migrants is in that way. And that means that our principle is then enough to win us the debate. Because we explain that Western countries profit off of the bodies of people from developing countries who are the victims of their colonialism because they were the ones who spread the sports and decided which sports would be dominant. They were the ones who accumulated wealth through forms of colonialism and they exploited that income gap ruthlessly to stay ahead through neo-colonialism, which means that they should not be allowed to continue that exploitation through sport, where they constantly attract the best players and use them to beat the very countries those players are from, the very countries that they colonized. But note, even in the rare examples they want to talk about where the flow is reversed, that doesn't mean the principle doesn't apply we still explain in those circumstances, you have reduced the capacity of the nation of origin to compete and to succeed at that sport. You've taken away someone who could have been a role model. You've taken away their capacity to have pride in that team because someone who would have been there is no longer there. You've given everyone in that country someone less to root for. And we say that is a legitimate thing to compensate for, even if it does occur in the opposite direction. And we explain in our model that you'd be able to wait for things like the percentage of development that occurred or the capacity to pay. You would be fine to demand those circumstances, but notably they were incredibly rare for the reasons I've just provided to you. What responses do we get to the principles? Firstly, they say countries have a right to pick players who have moved to and now live in their country. We agree they have a right to do it. They would just have to pay extra money to compensate for the harm that we identify. They say, well, the destination might, country might have contributed to that development. Sure, that is like mitigatory and already accounted for in our model, where we said the cost would be the development cost in that ho in the country of origin. So that isn't an argument at all. Finally, they say this principle isn't specific enough because sports is not related to colonialism. We point out that colonialism is often the reason why particular sports are dominant, is often the reason why particular countries succeed at sport and otherwise don't. And obviously, this is specific to forms of colonialism that are rooted in sport that still exists today. So this principle must win us a debate because there are reparations that were due and we were the only team that allowed them to be paid.
They say that this is unfair to players, but we have a number of responses that do not receive sufficient response. Firstly, we point out that you ought to weight the harms to players far less significantly than the benefits we identify to other stakeholders. Why? One, because players are incredibly well off on either side. They're highly paid athletes and not the most sympathetic actor. Two, because a large part of the success is down to the lottery birth, so they don't have an entitlement to it. It is kind of arbitrary they achieved it. So it's fine when there is a more important moral obligation to weight it off against that, which is the third reason we identify that there are other obligations here. You have an obligation to your country of origin because they're the, the place that raised you, that believed in you, that put in the early development work that allowed you to succeed in the first place. Often that pulled money together from lots of people to allow you to move overseas and to experience those dreams and you ought to pay that back. So we'd say that's perfectly legitimate in this case and you ought to weigh that unfairness to players very insignificantly relative to the massive benefits that we point to in terms of why this makes sport significantly better. One, the fact that sport, me, that, that these national teams in countries of origins are now far, far better, right? Because all of this talent that they talk about that is just saturating the West comes back and helps those teams. It gives every one of those countries another role model to look up to, another chance to have an underdog narrative, another chance to develop a national identity that was so incredibly meaningful to each of the people in that country, another reason to root for the sport. But secondly, we said it made the sport better when games were more competitive because the West didn't monopolize all the talent and just steamroll over other people that meant that the sport was better it was more engaging there was more like you know there was there was more anticipation around each match it was good for every person who watched sport that was billions of people whose lives were improved as a result of this model but finally we explained that it was likely to make better for better development programs because in the instances where countries still did choose to engage with these players that gave money to to bring people back home in order to pay for development costs and to make sure that development occurred in domestically in countries of origin. They say, no, this is bad because now development will never occur in the West because why would you bother developing players who won't be able to play for your national team? Well, there's obviously a range of reasons to do, still do so. Firstly, often these countries are really desperate to win and will pay lots of money on the off chance that they produce one star player who they will then pay to play for their team. And we'd say that in many cases, that huge amount of money would do a lot of good. But secondly, the domestic leagues still want talent and they'll still pay huge amounts of money in order to be able to generate that talent. And that would occur independent of whether they could play for the National League or not. But we th told you lastly, and most importantly, often development didn't occur in the West to begin with. It occurred in countries like India for cricket, Brazil and Argentina for soccer, or Tonga for, uh, for football. It was a shame, or rugby. It was a shame that they failed to recognize it. This team has not done enough to take the debate. It must go to affirmative. I'd like to thank the third affirmative speaker for that speech and welcome the third negative speaker. Hey, can I be heard? Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, Brendan. F1. All right, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. The first question I'm going to ask in this speech is what is your country of origin? Because there seems to be a, a pivot at Udai to making the claim that now your country of origin is any country that you could have plausibly claimed uh, citizenship for. Three responses. First, this is not the plain English definition of the words country of origin, which I think most people reasonably interpret to mean the country you were born in. Second, think about the implications of the world this sets up, where now every time you pick a player, you have to pay compensation to every country for which they could plausibly pl claim country of origin status or have any heritage. Third, this is actively contradicted in the second affirmative speech when we are told that the Irish diaspora who has Irish heritage is insufficiently Irish to play and that they care more about people who are more Irish. That is a concession that the people who have Irish heritage do not meet their country of origin criteria. They cannot walk this back at third affirmative, which is why that is the definition that this debate should be judged by. But finally, even if it is true that your country of origin is anywhere that you would have heritage for, our principle and our arguments are not contingent on this. Even if you have moved to a nation, you are still a legitimate part of that nation. First question, is this principally acceptable? Because... We would say we, you are requiring these of these nations, and a requirement is only morally permissible if this affirmative team can prove that it is owed. Our explanation is very simple. 
It is these people belong to these nations. They are legitimate parts of the nation. If you have moved somewhere, you're a legitimate part of that nation. And therefore, it is not morally impermissible to pick you. And therefore, you do not owe compensation for picking them. How is it that they try and prove that it is morally impermissible to pick someone who has moved to your nation or it was not from your country of origin? They have two claims. The first is that colonialism caused this. First, this is not always the case. In order to show that this is permissible, they need to show that in all cases, this is required. But second, the fact of a general harm of colonialism doesn't mean that you are an illegitimate part of that state. I would say that the fact that you are part of a state for reasons of colonialism does not illegitimize your membership of that nation. And third, it often flows towards the colonizers for the reason that often people were brought to countries at like the larger countries who did the colonization as a part of that colonialism. And then they are when they want to go and pay for the country of origin who their ancestors were stolen from, they are now required to pay reparations for that. Their second claim is that these countries did the development. First, as I point out, this is not always the case, so it doesn't meet their burden. Second, if we're going to ask ourselves the question, who is more likely to have invested in the development? Clearly, it is the wealthier country who will have invested in their development. Third, just because someone does some training in your country at some point does not make it morally impermissible for you to be picked for another team. This team wants to instrumentalize people in order to make reparations for colonialism. We say that is not acceptable. We say that you are a legitimate part of that nation. We say that if you live in that nation, you are a legitimate part of that nation. If you are part of that nation's diaspora, you are a legitimate part of that nation. That means that it is morally acceptable to pick you. Therefore, you do not owe them, those states, anything for picking you. And we win the debate. Noting their principled harm only accrues in one set of characterizations, which is when this is smaller states, like smaller states getting paid by larger states. Our principle works in both characterizations because we say regardless of the characterization, you're a legitimate part of this nation. Second question, and this is out the, so we've already won on the principle, but this way that we win this debate a second time over is to prove to you that you are simply unlikely to pick players now who are you who aren't from your country of origin uh, to really very, very little response. We explain three reasons why it is that you wouldn't pick these players. The first is that the cost is quite, uh, the, the cost is a disincentive and we point out that these sports confederations are often quite stint. Even Rugby Australia, one of the biggest rugby boards in the world, is close to insolvency. The FA, the English uh, Football Association, nearly had to sell off their national stadium because they were so poor. And we explain the structural reason is because they're dependent on government subsidies and it's often seen as luxury to, uh, to subsidize sport. Their response is to model that this is proportional to capacity. First, this has to be a sum. If they're going to get benefits of like developing, noting that not many players are picked for national teams. So if they're going to claim the benefit of developing these nations and their sports it has to be a somewhat large tax second as we point out most bodies are quite poor so something that is proportional uh, is still going to be a harm when most people cannot pay very much and third even if it is proportional it's still a disincentive but even if you didn't believe this we have two other reasons that receive no response first that you often do not want to pay things back to your colonizers and secondly that you do not want to pay money to confederations that you are actively competing against because it will aid you those two unresponded to reasons mean even if you don't believe the first one that gets responded to you have to believe that they are unlike they're less likely to pick players from other nations and we explain a series of structural reasons why it is that the incentive to pick these players is small and that is for the reason that often when you're first picking them you don't know how they'll integrate so you don't know what the benefit is and the harms of this were truly truly enormous we explained first of all it is deeply unfair first because they do not get to play for the country that they feel aligned to but secondly that often they are ineligible to play for any state in that instance, right? Because if you are a New Zealand rugby player and you play in England, this team has now made you ineligible to play for England because it's not part of your country of origin. You wouldn't get picked. And you're not able to play for New Zealand either because you have to be actively playing in the nation of New Zealand for New Zealand rugby in order to be picked for their national team. And lots of different sports have that mechanism of having to play domestically. This means they literally cut out players from being able to play international sport at all. That practical harm of such magnitude that their failure to respond must instantly lose them the debate. But secondly, we explain that this is terrible for representation because migrant representation in sports teams is enormously important for getting things like the reduction of racism and understanding that those people are a legitimate member of your nation. They say, ah, but countries have minorities who are born there and therefore are part of that country of origin. First, obviously in quite a number of states, migrant populations make up a significant part of their minority population. 
But second, even if you can pick people of the same ethnicity, we point out that the migrant stories are particularly valuable in and of themselves, even if they are, we could pick people of the same ethnicity. Already on the practical question, we are well up in this debate for their lack of response to that. But finally, let's then turn to the issue of how these player flows are likely to happen. So there's two characterizations, right? There's the characterization of small countries having to pay large countries, which we push, and the large countries having to pay small countries, with which they push. Let's look at their reasoning for why it is large, it's likely to be large countries countries paying small countries. Uh, their first is you want to play for a big country for reasons of big prestige and big money. Well, first of all, usually you're not getting paid that much money to play for the national team. Most of the money that you get paid comes from playing your club sports. Like lots of national teams just donate all their money anyway. And secondly, often you don't want to play for the big nations for reasons of prestige. You want to play for the one that you feel that you have the ethnic link to. Their better claim is that the reason it's likely to be larger nations paying smaller nations is those larger nations have more money to develop players in the biggest league. The problem with this is that this gives us both characterizations because not only does it mean that it's going to end up with like players being brought in and then raised and then playing for them but it also means that those countries have the largest supply of players who could then go back and play for countries of their birth we explain two structural reasons that receive no response why it's largely likely to be small countries paying large countries first it's simply harder to get into the top teams they often go and seek other teams uh in order to get paid that's like how people born in australia made up an enormous percentage of people playing for other nations at the nrl world cup because it was simply very hard to get into the Australian team. And secondly, we explain there are simply way more smaller nations than there are bigger nations. So that means that overwhelmingly, the flow is likely to be of players uh, that is likely to be money going from small nations to large nations. But secondly, we point out another devastating practical harm that they never countenance, which is that you are simply less likely to develop good players in the first instance from other countries because it means that you now would have to pay a fee if they ended up playing for your national team, which means that you would then you are then more likely to not scout in players from other nations. This means two things. First, it is an enormous practical harm because people are denied development opportunities. But secondly, it nukes their characterization because even if right now the characterization is large countries paying small countries, when those large countries stop developing players from small countries because they have to pay, in the long term, it is our characterization. We want the principle for the reason that if you live in a nation, you are a legitimate part of that nation. There's not a moral harm to pick you. You are a part of it. Diaspora is a part of it. People who live there were a part of that nation. You ought to be able to be picked. So, so proud to negate. to thank the third negative speaker for that speech and welcome the negative reply. Starting in three, two, one. There is a very simple problem to this affirmative team, and that is that they cherry-picked their characterizations. Sure, sometimes some of these countries' uh, transfers are involved in context of colonialism. Sure, sometimes it is often the countries in the global south that do most of the development. But as we explain at first and reiterate at third, their burden was to support a blanket policy version that applied in all circumstances. So it's their burden to prove that their favorable characterization occurred either in all or the dominant most of the times, and they never really met that burden. But by contrast, the harms that the negative team provided were true, irrespective of the context in which they were applied to. Because no matter what, we should not raise the barrier of entry to uh, dis disallow players to represent the countries that they feel that they ought to represent. And that no matter what, we shouldn't force countries to siloize and to only develop their ingrown talent, irrespective of how that development flows. Because it was only the negative team that ran arguments that were independent of context, that is the simplest reason why we just win the debate. There were two questions. Firstly, if Western countries footed the bill, why would this be harmful? Secondly, if smaller nations with the bill, why is that likely and why is that harmful? Let's start on the first question, not because it's the most likely characterization, but because it is the only paradigm that this affirmative team deigns to engage with. The negative team is, by contrast, the only team that competed in both worlds. So if we win on the affirmative team's own characterization, we instantly win this debate. And the th problem that I want to note with the affirmative team in this issue is that they never adequately explain why Western nations would still import talent when the cost of importation was greater. At best, 
The best responses come from third affirmative, who just suggest to you that there are reasons independent of this policy to still foster development. But the reason why those that analysis was less convincing than the one you heard, the negative team, is because none of those reasons were related to the change inherent to this debate. Firstly, because cost was often the tipping point for developmental structures that were cash poor. Secondly, because there were cheaper alternatives like white English players, so you were not forced to rely on this option. And thirdly, because often many of these countries simply didn't want to pay other nations, nations that they would have to compete with in the Euros, compete with in the World Cup. So there was an active incentive not to do this policy that, as we note, a third negative got no response. The second problem with the affirmative team in respect to this issue is that they never explain why their principle outweighs the circumstances in which the principle either does not apply or, in fact, is grossly inappropriate. And the important thing to note is the asymmetry of this burden. The affirmative team had to prove that it was permissible in all situations, whereas all we had to do is outline a series of scenarios in which it would be very gross. So even if our latter characterization of smaller nations footing the bill was the less likely characterization, it was still a characterization that meant that this affirmative team did not meet their principal threshold. Gassan then on the second issue, if smaller nations fit the bill, why is that bad? And the thing I want to note is that the affirmative team's proof of this issue to explain that it is marginal was largely unconvincing because the extent of their analysis is to suggest that larger countries just have more money and simply are more attractive. But as we note at the negative, that kind of money only applies to the club level of sports, but not the national level of sports, where largely people do not operate on the basis of money because they do not really get paid that well, but on matters of national pride and who people the, uh, which nations people believed that they were a part of. So these reasons were insufficient. By contrast, we provided three structural reasons from second negative, never engaged with as to why this characterization was far more likely. First, due to differences in developmental structure, that the problem of lack of money that this affirmative team pointed to is precisely the reason why it is often the case that the development happens in the wealthier nations. Secondly, because of ease of migration. And thirdly, because it is realistically much more likely that a player couldn't get into the English team and therefore when rather than in the other way. Those reasons establish that their characterization that they never wanted to engage with was in fact the one that cost them this debate. Very proud to applause. I'd like to thank the negative reply speaker for that speech and welcome the affirmative reply. Hey, can I be heard? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let me just get my uh, timer working. Okay. I'm going to start in three, two, one. Side negative relies on the characterization that the set of players we are talking about in this debate are raised in Western nations and then go to play for the country of their heritage. And that the reason, and, that, and this means that paying compensation will be regrettable in that circumstance. Side affirmative can deal with this by assuming, by first assuming, but not conceding the core piece of characterization and then explain why the policy of compensation will still be preferable to the alternative, which is what I'll do first. Then I'll explain why the characterization is wrong. Side negatives say that it's terrible for developing nations to pay developed nations, and this just broadly feels quite bad. Affirmative explain four, three things in response. 
The first is that the principle still applies. And amusingly, this is never responded to beyond a burden push that no, like, you know, you could only you'd only support a policy that allowed for compensation in some circumstances if only compensation was genuinely meant to be guaranteed or given in every circumstance, which is insane and no legal system would ever endorse. But the second thing they the second thing side affirmative point out, and the reason why side affirmative were thoughtful in prep about the model is that you can weigh the ability, you can weigh, uh, you weigh the amount of compensation that's required and how much compensation is required based on the capacity to play, based on the amount that people contribute to development, contribute to development. And that explains why side negative spend an awful lot of time trying to smear the affirmative case by explaining that, oh, well, they're denying these countries the right to pick the players they want. But of course, these countries still have the right to do it. They merely have to pay judge and that and the amount they have to pay is judged based on the fair amount. And we would point to the fact that in first phone of speech, there is a clear explanation to benefit these smaller countries' experience when a well-developed player that becomes from a more developed country, assuming that this characterization is in fact accurate, and then it's only natural that they pay for some of those capital costs. It may seem icky to side negative, but unfortunately they didn't take the time to do that rebuttal, which is precisely why that material can't work for them. But let's move on and ask which characterization is more likely, because both teams had a preferred set of characterization, which is to say side affirmative wanted to talk about small Pacific Island nations, side negative wanted to talk about the French national team, presumably because they'd seen the one Vox video about this and decided to build their entire case on that basis. Side affirmative, however, give a set of structural reasons that overwhelm these, and like, you know, the one cherry that is picked by the other side, which is the French national team. Those structural reasons are as follows. The first is that this way in which sport transmits often went from colonizer to colonizer. The second is that the largest sports markets where the fans have the most money and where wages are the highest are in the most developed countries with the countries that benefited from colonialism. The third is just the obsidian observation that most people are born in the developing world. The fourth is that players want to go to play for high prestige countries because they want to be in the highest prestigious national teams. And the, and the fifth is just the observation that is made third, which is to say the opposite would feel unintuitive. And the only real responses we get are the structural reasons you hear, and second negative about, which involve a set of assertions about development structure and ease of migration. We would point to, when weighing this one, the comparative sophistication of the affirmative analysis vis-a-vis -vis the negative na an analysis. But two, the side affirmative would also Side affirmative would also note that in the vast majority of circumstances, ease of mi migration patterns have eased up significantly in the past several decades as opposed to any prior time, which is suggestive of the high level of migration. You can point at an average reasonable person would probably know, for example, the size of the Premier League, for example, has expanded tremendously very recently, but that was not the case in the past, suggesting that most players there are recent migrants. But even if that weren't true, the analysis so that given as to why the principle would still apply, even if negative characterization is correct, is true. At this point, the structural reasons lock in. Side affirm to explain why players get more information because they understand how much they're costing. Two, they breaks down talent monopolies and gets people moved across different places so that natural, like native or uh, people who live in Algeria make it fun and easier to make the uh, Algerian team because they're not competing with people who can be in the French team and there is better development programs and these countries have an incentive to use them to make money. They have two kind of glass gasps here. They say, oh, well, these countries were engaged in development, but we explain that domestic leaves will be far more likely to engage in that development anyway. Why would you leave talent on the table like that? They then say players would lose out that is contingent on these national on these national bodies not uh, refusing to afford not being able to afford it their only substantiation there is an assertion of third a third neg that these these water supporting bodies are poor we would point out most countries want to win and are willing to pay for those reasons I'm incredibly proud of it i'd like to thank the affirmative reply speaker for that speech and thank you all for an excellent debate um